Welcome, everybody. Uh, we have our monthly colloquium once more uh, before a weekend. Uh, and next month's course is AI. Your packets will be ready before you go off on the weekend. Pick them up on your way out. This month, I am really, really pleased to have with us Professor Bob Sloan, who was a colleague of mine at University of Illinois, and he's still there. Now, temporarily, he's the Program Director of Theory of Computing at the National Science Foundation. And today, he's going to talk about machine learning. Thank you, Shai. It's a pleasure to be here. I had a lot of fun working with Shai way back when. He assured me that I should expect an audience that was a little bit stronger than the typical group of MIT PhD students, so I could just fly right along in speaking to you. Uh, more seriously, stop me, interrupt me, yell at me. I do give more research talks to research audiences than effectively undergraduate audiences. What I am going to try to do in an hour is give you a overview of my field at the intersection of AI and theory of computing and then bore down into a little bit of my own research um, which is the problem of machine learning with noisy data that is to say in the models we're looking at machine learning where you have a teacher and from time to time the teacher gives you wrong answers, either ignorant, I don't know answers, or flat out false answers, hence the title. So the little subfield I work in, ah, the heck with it, so we'll have strips that keep the printer from melting the slides is called computational learning theory. Uh, it's about to have its, gee whiz, 13th or 14th annual conference in Amsterdam this summer. So I'll try and explain what that's all about to you in the first 10 to 15 minutes of the talk. Um, and then bore down into a little bit of my own research on the subject. Uh, our constituency is a combination of the AI community and the theory of computing community. So I guess I'm a bit of a prequel for your upcoming talks about AI for the next week or so. Um, AI is a wonderfully mixed up controversial field. I uh, had the pleasure in the mid-80s of taking the course required of all graduate students who wanted to pass the PhD qualifiers at MIT, and they said to me on day one, by God, AI is not about solving chess problems, it's not about running robots around the place, it's not about this pipe dream of automatic high quality translation from one natural language like English to another like French or Spanish. The core items in AI are at that time, I think the MIT credo is above all knowledge representation with such fields as planning and machine learning being also important. And time went by. I cranked out my first couple of papers, and one of them was at the big AI conference called Triple AI, and I went off, you know, now a year or two or three later to give it, and I went to the big, you know, invited grand poobah speech. The invited grand poobah was Raj Reddy from Carnegie Mellon. Um, there are three or four places that will all tell you they are the leader in the world in artificial intelligence. Two of those are MIT and Carnegie Mellon. And of course, the entire faculty of Stanford knows both of those claims are wrong. But anyway, so 
Raj Reddy gets up to give his invited speech before this biggest research gathering of the year and says, I want to tell you all some of the really groundbreaking work we've been doing in the last couple of years at Carnegie Mellon in core problems in AI. And let me list off the problems I'm going to talk about. And sure enough, I'm not making this up. He said, first, I want to talk about our mobile robots. Second, I want to talk about our contributions to Deep Blue, that is now the champion computer chess program in the world. And at that point, was still ranked number seven or eight in the world. It had advanced uh, up to the very top, yeah. And lastly, some really good progress on machine translation of natural languages. So, as I say, it's a field with a lot of views, but one way to sort all this out that a recent textbook put forward conveniently for me to steal from is that some of the work is in trying to make computers think or act the way people do. Um, you get into wonderful questions of philosophy and AI. You get into wonderful work in cognitive science where there are collaborations between computer scientists and psychologists who are trying to extract what is this commonality of thinking. Is there anything being done by both chimps and people and machines? And, you know, maybe the first AI paper ever was Alan Turing's on the notion of the Turing test, uh, which a place like this you ought to be reading at some point. But we ain't going to talk about that today, and that isn't what I do, except it makes wonderful light reading, sometimes wonderful heavy reading. Uh, a more practical goal is trying to make machines think or act rationally. Whether they do that by somehow computing 10 gazillion points in a 17-dimensional vector space and doing something with them and then come up and say, well, uh, I think the plan is you should first push the button, then wait for the light to turn green, and then cross the street, or whether they do it by some way closer to how human beings do. We don't care. We just want rational thoughts and actions. And within that, there's uh, been two streams. Most of the classic textbooks from, say, the late 70s, um, in the 80s and as recently as Pat Winston's 92 book talk about getting programs to think rationally. So, for instance, in Winston's 92 writing, he defines AI as the study of the computations that make it possible to perceive, reason, and act. A somewhat different and I would say more modern view is the hell with thinking, we want to do something useful. Um, uh, if you want to hang a textbook on this, you know, the late 90s book by Russell and Norvig, whose subtitle is Mumble Foo Intelligent Agents Mumble, uh, about you know building machines that rationally behave to do something useful, whether that's playing chess or making a plan for a manufacturing company or solving various machine learning problems. And so that's sort of the highfalutin philosophy. There's umpteen topics in AI. And the one that I care about is machine learning. Uh, broadly speaking, you know, building programs that as a result of experience get better at what they're doing. Uh, the ultimate 
you know, 23rd century goal of the movement is to completely put programmers out of work, that somehow the computer will learn what needs to be done instead of needing to be told uh, by a programmer a detailed recipe to do it. Uh, definition from the usual standard text in machine learning, you know, what does he say? It learns from experience with respect to a class of tasks and a performance measure. If its performance is measured by the measure, improves as it gets more experience. And there's all sorts of things you could put under that general header. The entire uh, remaining uh, 40 minutes I have, we'll be talking about the problem of learning from examples. Formally, this says, I want to learn how to classify some objects uh, according to a classification function, uh, and the experience will be either training data, I give you some examples of objects in their correct classification, or that I can go and ask questions of a teacher or an expert. To bring this down into somewhat more concrete terms, I've got a world... So can you even read these if you're way in the back? Cool. And are they in focus if you're way in the back? Okay. I have two classes of objects that I am concerned about. Uh, in you know, 1985 AI talks, the objects were always elephants and the other animals. And you know, so you have some description of the zoo, maybe in terms of a great big vector of features. These were the guys who loved a uh, scheme or uh, actually a different dialect uh, which became common lisp but is real, real close to scheme. So you sort of imagine your um, round parentheses with each of these features listed inside. And you know, if it is big and has a trunk and is gray and has four legs, it's an elephant. And if any of those features are missing, it's something else. Um, in applications, people have looked at studying medical data for drug treatments. When a doctor, or really set of doctors, studies some new drug for pick your favorite disease, they have a huge number of features they write down about each patient. You know, he was diagnosed with a degree three left-handed thyroid cancer of form alpha beta. And his height was, his weight was, his age was, his blood pressure, his cholesterol, his triglycerides, date of first onset, number of centimeters of da 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 da. And, you know, well, they give this new drug to the patients and some of them get better and some of them get buried because they die. And you know, there's a huge interest in learning to predict when a new patient walks in the door, who's going to get better and who is this drug not going to help. So, you know, they could generate uh, hypothetical molecules with their computer and wanted to know which ones would have pharmaceutical properties, perhaps, and which ones wouldn't. And, you know, if the chances a priori were, you know, one in a million, if you could get that down to one in a thousand by f focusing on the right ones, they went and put their bench chemists to work and then tested them because at one in a thousand it was worth doing that, but one in a million it wasn't. I think I would have been a bunch richer and also unemployed if I had taken. <laughs> well, now right after, yeah, three months later, they were bought out by DuPont. Everybody's options vested, but turned out they had evidently awesome bench chemists, and DuPont quickly fired all the computer and machine learning wizards and had bought them to get the bench chemists. 
Um, so what else did I put down? Uh, uh, oh, these days, a lot of people are analyzing customer data to figure out which customers you should do things with. Um, an ancient classic work involved learning uh, which figures were arches. It's obviously, you can get huge feeds from Dow Jones about the past attributes of publicly traded stocks. Um, this is partially here as a warning. I don't believe this is particularly an achievable goal. And certainly if the uh, strong random walk theory uh, uh, the stock market is true, it's not an achievable goal. Oh, I don't have my prop a coin, but you know we could also try and you know record a ton of characteristics each time I flipped a coin and to predict heads and tails, and we would fail on the fundamental information theory grounds that you know. You can only learn the right classification rule if one exists. It's not obvious that one exists in all these cases. <coughs> now, yeah. why do we want to do this if I haven't made it clear? There's some training phase where you, know, you get the information about the trial of the drug. But the point is to have your machine learning program give you back a classification rule that you can use in the future to say, okay, yeah. this guy would be helped by the drug and this wouldn't, when you don't know the correct answer. You, know, you could only find the correct answer out by actually giving him the drug and waiting but you want to know up front whether you should do that. So that's the purpose of machine learning. And there's you know, any number of problems where people would like to be able to use it. Now, there's about a hundred, oh, more than that really is, maybe 500 people cranking out papers and technical reports in this area each year. And of those 500, 450 do something useful. And then there's 50 like me who are out of the sort of theory and algorithms community. Uh, our little side corner of this field goes under the name of computational learning theory. And what we do is take the approach of theory of computing and algorithms, you know, all the stuff you came across in the Sipser book and in, uh, did you guys use the Corman license and reverse? Yes. This approach, some of the specific bits and pieces from there are used, but most importantly, the world view that we want to build a crisp mathematical model of the world, of the problem, including in this case definitions of, so what does it mean to learn a classification rule? Now, what are your inputs? What are your outputs? How well do you have to perform? And then we want to design algorithms that achieve good learning under those definitions, or perhaps say, well, this problem is too hard. Uh, it would be NP-complete, or more correctly, NP-hard to get a learning result for this problem. Or there's one result that sort of says, you know, if you can get a learning result for this problem, you can also break all known current modern crypto systems that if the things that we believe make the cryptography hard to break are really hard, then you can't solve this kind of a classification problem. And if you want results tomorrow, you should go and hire one of 
my more applied brethren because they're going to do as well as they can today and that's very valuable research but it's also very valuable to have a yardstick to measure them against and you know he'll say well I downloaded from University of California Irvine their standard test set and I ran my new 10,500 lines of Java algorithm on it and I got accuracy 71%. Is that good or bad? <laughs> should he be pleased that he's above 50% or should he? And the, that's sort of the downside of empirical work is this lack of standards. Um, if we could solve all problems this way, this would be the way to go. An algorithm together with a proof of its performance is the ideal, and then you can go implement it. Uh, the catch is we're generally able to give crisp, proved results for only relatively simple problems. Although, um, the two hottest machine learning technologies of the past few years and so the first big advance in 10 or 20 years uh, are things that go under the name of boosting and support vector machines and both of those grew out of work done especially boosting in the computational learning theory community people sort of said so what techniques do I want to solve this theoretical criteria and prove I've solved it. And then they said, oh, gee, let's go code it up and tweak it a little. And that's where, you know, as I say, the two current best practical performers came from. And especially in one case, I don't know that anyone would ever have thought of the ideas if they had just been working on practical problems and they had been forced to think, way, way outside the box because they had this theory problem and you know, conventional methods just weren't going to, might or might not meet it in practice, but weren't going to come with a proof. And this whacked out method did come with a proof. Um, questions up to this point. So the set of everything we're talking about yeah, is our domain. Another word you'll see in the literature is instance space. Yeah, so it's the set of all uh, architectural constructions in the universe. And for the sake, of, I'm talking today. Ooh, that's hard to read. Let's try again in a darker pen color. And somewhere in there as yeah, the you know, arches, the some subset of that domain are the ones in class one, the positive instances, the ones we're trying to pick out. And we just have this big space of stuff we're trying to split into two things. Being theorists Usually, our domain will be either the set of all strings over some alphabet, or it will be, you know, the set of all binary vectors of some length n. And we call any subset of that a concept. Uh, the old AI trick of using suggestive vocabulary so you think it really has something to do with human cognition. The one we're looking for we call the target class and especially in this formal theory-driven world sometimes, uh, in fact, typically we'll start with the assumption that the target concept comes from some known set of concepts that, you know, we're trying to identify some regular language, for instance. So, 
you know, the in that case the domain would be the set of all strings. The concept class would be the set of all regular languages. And the target concept would be uh, some particular DFA. Is DFA the abbreviation? Some particular DFA or equivalently some particular regular expression. You know, these are the ones in the target concept. So that's my fancy special purpose vocabulary. And us formal learning guys have looked at, oh, three or so major different models uh, and lots of little tweaks on each one of them. I am going to pick the one that is both a personal favorite to write papers about and the easiest to explain in just a few minutes to an audience who hasn't seen it before. The so-called query learning model due to Dana Angluin uh, paper from uh, mid to late 80s. So now the way we're going to gain experience, the training phase, is we assume that there are a pair of teachers uh, who in the best traditions of computer science theory we call oracles. Um, you, know, you guys went through the Sipser book. You've all seen oracles. I'm sorry. Um, one oracle is the equivalence query oracle, which says, here's my proposed DFA. Is it the right answer? Is it equivalent to the target concept? And the teacher either says, yes, you got it, or no, that isn't the right thing, and in that case gives me a counterexample. Here is some string where the correct concept and your hypothesis disagree. So if your DFA accepts the string, it really shouldn't be in the target concept. If your DFA doesn't, it should. And the second kind of oracle available to you is the membership oracle. Here's a string. Is this in the target concept, yes or no? And the game is to give an algorithm to ask questions that is guaranteed to get to the target efficiently. That is to say, you know, polynomial time in the natural problem size and only polynomial questions asked. You know, obviously if our domain is the set of all length n bit vectors. We could just ask two to the n e membership queries and we would know what was going on. However, as Shai presumably taught you back in September, two to the n is too darn big once n is any kind of number anybody cares about. So the, uh, the question is how do you ask poly and n questions and get to the answer? And first, I want to give you a little toy example to make sure we understand the general rules of the game. So let us assume that the possible concepts in our concept class, that our domain is the natural numbers, and the rule we're looking for is either the empty set the set of all the natural numbers, the set of the primes, the set of the squares, or some contiguous interval of integers. And so at the beginning of time, maybe we say, is the right answer the empty set? And we get back a counterexample. Uh, let's... No... Say we get back 17. Uh, now I need you all to play along with me. Uh, somebody propose a query. You promised me they'd talk. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Okay. 
Um, no. Is it the primes? And it, DQ primes. No. 16, and I heard a membership query on 4. Membership query 15. Pardon? Okay. So on until somebody tells us. Somebody? My God in heaven, I uh, you told me to try they were smart. I was hoping someone knew about binary instead of linear search. <laughs> and just to finish up and be done, let's say uh, we split the difference between 10 and 14 and ask, is it the interval? 12 to um, 17. And the answer comes back, yes. Just to clarify, the EQ primes, when it gives back to 16, I'm not clear on it. It meant that if the rule was prime, that the true rule and the primes rule disagreed on the instance 16. So the correct rule, the interval 12 to 17, classifies 16 as a positive instance in the target concept. The incorrect concept primes does not include 16 as a positive instance. Primes would make 16 a negative instance. So it only gives one one instance. That when you ask an a, when you ask an equivalence query, you only get back a single counterexample, and it could be either kind of error: positive for negative, or negative for positive. Type one and type two, if you know that literature. Other questions. If the upper limit of the interval were 10 billion, would it answer no, 16 anyway, even though it would tell you 10 billion? That is a great question um, about how you're going to have to do the math modeling of this problem. And the answer is that when you really sit down to write, yeah, the notation section of the article for the archival journal that the running time you're allowed is going to be polynomial in the representation of the target concept and the representation of the longest counter example ever returned. So it's only reasonable yeah, that the poor or poor at learning algorithm has to at least read. Did you say 16 million or billion? I mean, 16. The poor learning algorithm has to read that counterexample 16 billion. So, besides it needing running time polynomial and yada 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 yada, it also better be allowed to be polynomial in the log of 16 billion because it will take us the log of 16 billion digits or bits, either one, to write down 16 billion. So you are exactly right. In this model, um, in many cases, we're just working with the domain being length and bit vectors, and then that issue doesn't come up. But in this model, 
if the domain includes different length objects, then you also have to pay attention to the length of the longest counterexample received. And in general, a more to answer a question you didn't ask, you should think of the oracle or teacher as being very ill-mannered. Another name for these creatures is the adversary. Um, you know, just to get that firmly fixed, teacher equals adversary. Because in this case, what we're interested is how, what guarantee can you give about your learning performance no matter how unhelpful the legal answers from the oracle are. So you have to prove that you eat up only so many queries even if you get you know, relatively less helpful rather than relatively more helpful. So as not to make poor shy and myself and all my colleagues in teaching feel too bad, uh, there are a few papers, even one including myself as a, a co-author, on a notion uh, called teaching dimension where you're assuming that the oracles are trying to be as helpful as possible. And that's the distinction between teaching and learning. So in this particular case, though, we, the oracle may be unhelpful, but it's at least going to guarantee to be right. Yes. For the next five minutes, we are assuming that the oracle is indeed, you know, like the uh, word suggests, infallible that all its answers are correct. And a more, as I said, the algorithm should ask a number of questions that's polynomial and the natural problem size. To get away from some of those technical difficulties, I'm now going to concentrate on the domain you know, 0, 1 to the n, length n bit vectors. And one of the first algorithms published was for the concept class monotone DNF, disjunctive normal form, uh, not the CNF you saw when you were tortured with NP completeness, but it's dual, a or of ands. Uh, for instance, you know, we might have x1, x3, x7, or x2, x3, or x1, x5, x6, x8. And there's the algorithm, but I think the best thing is to run through a little example. So let me step over to the board and find, ooh, pretty big chalks. Um, so, for our first example, to make it nice and small, let's say n equal 4 target is x1, x2. And the algorithm says we initialize H, keep the variable H up here, to be um, the everywhere false rule, um, which technically is the disjunctive full arm, the or of no clauses. And so we ask an equivalence query. Somebody give me a counterexample. What's something that sat, what's a length for bit vector that satisfies this but not this? Um, how about, In general, with monotone formulas, so the more ones in the vector, the more likely it is to be positive. It's a, so, 
So the rule everything's false disagrees. And we have this term building loop, this while loop that says I'm supposed to go through and now I try shutting off the first bit. Is, and when I ask if this is positive, what comes back? False. So now I try shutting off the second bit. And what comes back? Also false. Now I try shutting off the third bit. Ah. What comes back? True. So I keep the third bit off. And I try setting off, shutting off the fourth bit. What comes back? True. And now I update by adding in a term that has variable for which this is the characteristic vector. So it has a 1 in the x1 place and a 1 in the x2 place. And it has zeros here. So I add in the term x1, x2. And now I'm going to ask an equivalence query. And I've found the target concept. Should we make a second run through this with a uh, multi-term target? Well, we'll just go over what would happen if we had one, say if it was x1, x2, or... Ah, actually, um, I wasn't quite clever enough because of the order I want. In general, what will happen, if you think of, is if there were, these answers would have been different, but if there was a second term, x2, x4, now I would be forced to get a, an example that satisfied the term x2, x4, but didn't satisfy this one. So I might get back uh, 1, 0, 1, 1. Did we strike that? Yeah. Side note. x1, x2, or x2, x4. Or then eq x1 x2 might return 0. And then with member ship queries, that would go down to 0, 1, 0, 1, and I would find the second term. <coughs> If you have this picture in your head, which you probably don't, but you might have to discrete math, of all the bit vectors in a lattice with the all ones at top and the Hamming weight n minus 1 is all the children going down to the all zero vector at the bottom. What's happening is each time we walk through that main while loop, we're getting a new term and we're walking down in that lattice to get the characteristic vector of that term. And my plan was not really to prove to you why this algorithm works and analyze it too closely, but to give you a flavor of one of these algorithms. But uh, you all are the customers. Uh, we can either talk some more about this 
or I can give you a little bit of talk about what happens if occasionally these answers are wrong. What's the learning here? Is, is, are you, is the problem here to find the algorithm that improves itself? The, the, no, the problem here is the, to find a classifier. The syntactic form monotone DNFs is perhaps too limited to really have traction in the real world, but perhaps not. If you represent uh, handwritten characters on a 8 by 11 grid, you now have 88 Boolean variables, and you know the ones that are the character A are some complicated formula over those 88. The objective here is to start with no idea what the classification rule is and by asking some limited number of questions, which here will be something like order n times the number of terms and not 2 to the n to find out what are the right rules. In practice, membership queries are almost always answered by asking a human expert. Equivalence queries can either be answered by asking a human expert or by just getting a large bunch of labeled examples and saying, if this rule disagrees with one of the labeled examples, that's my counterexample. If this rule agrees with this whole big set of labeled examples, it's probably close enough to the right rule that I can go ahead and use it. So that's the idea, is to converge on a classification rule. And a, you know, here, I think, a handwritten characters or typed characters, for that matter, is a good idea to have in your mind. You might get suspicious that monotone disjunctive normal form formulas aren't rich enough and will need more general ones, but the, that's the idea. We're going to try and get some representation. And man, if you can drive your accuracy up out of the low 90s and into the high 90s for just the 10 handwritten digits, the United States Postal Service would like to pay you a lot, a lot, a lot of money for that patent. Um, yeah, this is a problem that people are most interested in. More questions? I suspect I'm just going to get um, to tell you a little bit about what I've worked on um, and not actually show you any of it. But my issue has been, so there are people out there consing up all these algorithms. They all assume that they're getting the correct answers out of these oracles. In the real world, that's probably not such a good assumption. In fact, a fellow named Eric Baum down at the NEC Research Labs in New Jersey came up with an algorithm. Uh, wasn't membership and equivalence queries, but it might as well have been a, a tweak on the model. And it would learn anything that could be represented by a Fubar Baz neural net, which is a pretty rich and powerful representation. And he proved that if you gave it this many questions to ask, it would give you back the right rule if there was a right rule to be found. And with a colleague, he coded this thing up. They wanted to do handwritten digit recognition. And there's an easy source of experts. We can answer membership queries. And they ran it. And it smelled its performance was so bad. To read about it, you have to get the proceedings of some obscure Beijing 
fifth tier computer conference, because people don't really like to publicize their failures so much. And the question is, so what went wrong? And one hypothesis might be, well, the form of the neural net was too restricted, but I report to you that, isn't it? It turns out that when you've got human beings answering your queries for you, and you say, you know, let's say I'm going to just distinguish sevens and fives. What's this? It's a seven. What's this? It's a five. But the next membership query you might ask is, what's this? And the human classifier is unhappy. And this is something that's well studied 20 years ago in the cognitive psych literature. That when you at, there's this famous series of cup versus bowl studies. And you know, you show people pictures of the cup and they say it's a cup. Show pictures of the bowl, they say it's a bowl. But you give them pictures where you continuously deform the cup into the bowl and you have no idea what they're going to say. In that gray area, you, know, you get completely inconsistent responses. Same person may give different answers on a different day. They may answer something that's 53% cup is bull and something that's 57% cup is bull and something that's only 50% cup is cup. Yeah, that, yeah. So... From a formal modeling point of view, this means your oracles don't always give the right answers. And <coughs> now, of course, I've gotten you know, through the overview of the field and just at the point where I could start talking about my own research, but I also, uh, taking a look at my watch, realize I'm at about 55 minutes. So I will just report to you that we've done uh, some work in modeling two cases. The slightly gentler one where the queries sometimes respond, I don't know. And the more tricky one to handle where the queries sometimes just give wrong answers. And... You know, there's a variety of results. You know, you can convert any algorithm that wants perfect data into one that tolerates lies, but you may have an exponential blow up in the number of questions you have to ask. It may go from n to two to the n. If thus and such nice properties are satisfied, which, by the way, monotone DNFs do not satisfy the magic properties, there is a general purpose conversion. And in the other direction, you know, I can show you some examples of things where with perfect oracles, you, know, you can learn them in roughly n queries, but any strategy in the world would require two to the n queries if you have an oracle that might... Uh, say, I don't know even one time at a really bad instance in time. So that's uh, what I do uh, when I'm in the mode of teaching and writing research papers instead of in the road of mode of giving away money at the National Science Foundation. Questions? Cognitive scientists were doing it. Partly that's a reflection of this human tendency to make up things instead of saying, I don't know. Um, you know, you give an answer that might be wrong rather than admitting you don't know. And I'm just wondering in this class of problems you're dealing with where the wrong answer is one, it, it, what kind of real world analog is, is envisioned in that, uh, in that whole? Noise in the data. I guarantee you that if I go and I pay some undergraduate $11 an hour to sit in front of a screen and I flash handwritten digits at him for two hours and, you know, that 
all reasonable handwritten digits that if you were to spend, you know, a full 30 seconds first thing in the morning fresh, you could accurately answer every one. Nevertheless, by 40 minutes into this session of pushing buttons, if that undergraduate is answering 98 out of 100 correctly, I'll be very pleasantly surprised. One of the sad truths or interesting facts about machine learning in practice is data is always noisy. There is no clean data for Sal in the world. Other questions? I'm curious about this idea of the concept class that's sort of in your in your vocabulary. Because one of the goals that you set out at the beginning was to you know, be able to take a whole bunch of data where humans aren't sure whether or not there's a pattern there or not, um, and have machines sort of go looking into it and, and you know, determining whether or not there are patterns to be found. And I'm curious as to whether the, the concept class is sort of a sort of a convenience for this sort of area of research in order to kind of, you know, make make it sort of a manageable kind of a question. Um, and also whether there's there's work being done where you know where it's possible that the, the the kind of the input set is just arbitrary you know where there is no sort of overarching pattern to be oh done. the whole space of machine learning includes lots of different kinds of problems um, we formalists particularly like um, actually let me back way off and give a better <laughs> more intelligent answer. In machine learning, you have to make some assumption to get any traction. Um, if you have a universe of 2 to the n bit vectors, which is a very reasonable representation of lots of data, and you say, well, the rule could be anything, that gives you a space of two to the two to the n different rules. And in the only possible way you could exactly pick one is by going through and examining all two to the n objects for their classification. This business of, so saying, of all the two to the two to the n rules, I'm going to decide without log of 2 to the 2 to the n bits of information, as I say, without 2 to the n bits of information, on this rule instead of that rule is referred to as inductive bias. Induction being the process of coming up with a general rule from a few examples, um, or any of the old philosophy or maybe even cog psi majors out there, and bias being bias, because if you don't have some inductive bias, you ain't going to go anywhere. Now, what's a good form of inductive bias? We find it mathematically convenient in a lot of our work to assume that you know a priori that the rule is from some constrained set of rules. Others might say, well, Assume a probability distribution over all those 2 to the 2 to the n rules and assume that the rules that have a nice short representation are the more likely ones and the ones that have real long, funny, weird ones are less likely and use Bayes' law as you go and come up with some sort of probabilistic analysis. Um, but you have to have some sort of bias, I report to you that as a matter of uh, making empirical progress, disjunctive normal form without uh, negations is probably too weak a set of rules, but general disjunctive normal form seems actually there's some cog psych studies there that say human beings like rules in disjunctive normal forms that we're good at parsing them that if I tell you verbally um, you know alpha or beta or gamma and delta or alpha or epsilon 
we don't like CNFs. That they're, but if I tell you and make it, you know, you're entitled to deduct the kid if he's under 18 and living at home, or if he's 18 to 22 and you provide more than half of his support and his college tuition costs more than his shoes do. Oh, we like these, baba and bomb and bomb. So general disjunctive normal form is probably good enough. A something in between the two called conjunctions of horn clauses, in fact, seems to be the point at which you can start building usable systems. But you know, I, if you pick up a book on machine learning, I promise you that by the middle of chapter two at the latest, you'll hit the word inductive bias. It is a central question, and so your question's a very good one. What else can I tell people? What are the big successes on machine learning? The big successes, um, are, my point of view, are some bet. People have used classifier rules for years and years, and you know that in practice they tended to either build decision trees or neural nets, which was slow. Ate up a lot of data, took a lot of time, and was only somewhat accurate. The <coughs> um, best of the recent technologies based on support vector machines and boosting are quite accurate. Um, a lot of information retrieval folks are using this to automatically classify documents, web pages, news articles. Um, there is also been a lot of success in a more complicated settings of learning how to do things. Um, at this point, I know that the best checkers player in the world is the result of a machine learning program. And I think um, TD Gammon is one of the best backgammon players in the world. Checkers is actually sort of a funny one. Uh, the results of machine learning were for a long time the second best. Ch the world checker champion was somebody or other, I want to say a Brit, for like, 25 years and this person you know won every tournament they showed up for and the effective competition was for second place and the best pardon okay yeah right <laughs> i knew it was a mathematician marion tinsley i guess i always assume that with the first name Marion, it, that was such a. <laughs> no, I was assuming it was a man, but a oh, Brit. Right. <laughs> Maybe it was there originally, but he, he lived in Florida. For and eventually, Tinsley got old and sick enough that he stopped playing. And number two in line was, you know, a uh, out a player that was the output of a machine learning process. He actually died in the middle of a match. <laughs> the match was tied and he got sick with cancer they delayed it for six months and then he died so he never actually lost the match in his life he lost three games in his life you've been considering when he was learning three games in his life 10,852 and three he actually had to resign his uh, world champion status in order to play this machine originally because the bureaucrats <laughs> at the checkers uh, yeah they didn't want uh, they didn't want to sanction a match between a human and a computer for the world championship so he said well fine I won't <laughs> you know, what are you going to get you know, like, I'll play the machine so he played the machine and, uh, and anyway, one of his losses one of his three or four losses was to this machine That's are we talking about regular three by three checkers Black and red on an... No, checkers. Oh, I'm sorry. Checkers. <laughs>
And I was thinking, how could somebody be a tic-tac-toe champion? Because it's just so... <laughs> the, <laughs> the techniques that have been used in that game, and I'm positive, and I believe in um, checkers as well, but I'd have to double check. And also making some progress in automatically driving cars and riding bicycles, believe it or not, are called reinforcement learning, which has been one of the great successes. The status of games, and Chai is probably in a position to direct me, but chess is basically conquered by throwing a lot of special purposeness at it, at game trees, special purpose algorithms, special purpose hardware. Um, chess, checkers and backgammon, there were big successes with machine learning. And Go and Bridge, uh, the humans don't have anything to worry about for the foreseeable future. We're still uh, murdering the machines. Actually, so, so Connect Four is a win for the first player. And Connect Four is a solved problem, and, yes. Um, checkers, there's hope to actually essentially complete the whole game tree. They, they have it going from both ends now. They have the openings and the endings all done. They're kind of hoping to match in the middle in some dynamic programming way and, and be done with checkers. So. <laughs> there was a puzzle that a, a student of ours who was in here today, Sam Klein, told me at the beginning of this year, and maybe he told other students, but is very reminiscent of this stuff, uh, and maybe you kind of <coughs> heard of it. But it's basically, here's at least a distilled version of the puzzle as well as I can remember it. Uh, if you're trying to guess somebody's number and you can ask yes or no questions and clearly you can do binary search and get it in log base 2 uh, of the size of the number. So his question to me was, what if your, uh, your answerer, your responder, is an adversary and they're allowed to lie once and only once? They might not lie at all, but they're allowed to lie one time. Then what's the answer to the question, you know, the... I. Um, perfect number of steps it should take you to do it. Um, so is that, um, that's clearly a more special variation of this bigger area. Well, they, I mean, as you well know, a lot of this work in theory involves these sorts of adversary arguments. And broadly speaking, they all have the same kind of flavor and you know, are lower bounds of here's something where you can come up with the right answer very quickly with no lies and you need two to the n questions if you get one I don't know is sort of coming it from the other direction so how can we design a puzzle where it will be really easy in one case and really hard in the other right. so the, the, the thing about this I worked on this for a while and I finally came up with more or less the right answer and uh, Forget what you, oh, yeah, I remember now. So it took me a long time. I finally I realized that this is completely the same as given a sequence of bits and you want to correct one of the bits, at least in the puzzle that he was asking. It was basically one bit error, detection and correction. And how many extra bits do you need in order to detect one you know, bit in your original or whatever? So so I finally figured this out and I email him. He's a smart gentleman. I email him and I go, oh, it's just error correction. Um, I finally figured out a way to do it. And he goes, what is error correction? <laughs> so he had done this whole puzzle, I don't know, 30 years ago without noticing even to this day this connection to, I guess, a whole literature of stuff. But, but is there any, do you ever get any connection with, with um, turning these things into issues of error correction and error detection if you think of the answers as sequences of bits where you don't know which ones are right and wrong? You know, asking extra questions just in order to, questions about your previous questions. See, here you're restricted. You can only ask certain kinds of questions. He didn't restrict the questions. You can ask in his model, were your answers to questions one or three or five correct? Right? So there's more power there. So it seems like you can do a lot more when... Yeah, I don't think answer. that uh, using the idea of error correcting codes is going to give us much... It's because you're restricted in what kind of questions you can ask here, right? I mean, yes. Membership and equality is a very... Uh, narrow set, but if you think about how you would interface with you know, real world data sets, this, this is, is a much better answer than being able to ask, you know, 
has there been any noise in the data yet, or has it been perfect up until this right. time? Right. That's just a puzzle. Right. Oh, I don't. Or a model of other phenomena. Not the right model for this. Are there more questions? All right, thank you very much. And Bob's going to hang around for a little while longer if you want to uh, talk informally and we can finish up that food in the back. Thanks.